thank you for coming. Uh, my name's Eileen Baldry. I'm the Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Inclusion and Diversity, and I'm representing the Vice-Chancellor. The Vice-Chancellor is overseas. Uh, he usually uh, officiates at the inaugural professorial lectures, but I get this wonderful opportunity to do this. I'd first like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land, the Bejigal people, and to acknowledge elders past and present, to acknowledge any Aboriginal people here today, and to acknowledge that this land is and always will be Aboriginal land. So um, inaugural professorial lectures are a wonderful opportunity for us to hear our best and brightest people who have just ascended, <laughs> not to heaven, not quite, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but close to it, <laughs> but have ascended to the level of a uh, professor. That is our highest uh, academic level in the university, as I'm sure you all know. Uh, so this, e this afternoon, uh, we have the great pleasure of hearing from uh, two of our uh, newly minted uh, professors. And uh, we are going to uh, hear about the work that they want us to know about. I've been to quite a number of inaugural professorial lectures and I can tell you they are always fascinating because we are hearing from people who are at the peak of their intellectual work. Well, they'll get higher, but they are doing wonderful work. This is why they, they, they were promoted or why they were appointed at this level. So, to uh, take us on, uh, uh, really start us on our journey, um, I would like to introduce uh, the Dean of Engineering, um, Professor Mark Hoffman, and Mark is going to introduce our speakers. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much, Eileen. We are very lucky today to have two very, very interesting speakers. We are going to start with Cyril Boyer. Cyril, I actually won't say where Cyril came from because that's a part of his speech. But, <laughs> but I can say that since Cyril came to UNSW, he has been incredibly successful. There's a couple of themes that you'll see in the way that Cyril works. And one of those is that he is viewed as a wonderful person to work with. He's someone that's been very successful in building teams, both his own research team, but also working with those around him. And for someone who really hasn't been in the country that long on the scale of things, he's received a number of very significant awards. He has been very much recognised internationally, not just for, for his work with others, but also his own achievements. I've always been very proud to be at events where, where Cyril receives awards. Um, he does it very modestly, I have to say. He's even going red with the mention of it. <laughs> um, but I think it was last year, there was sort of Cyril, there was the award of the week for Cyril. It was getting a little bit embarrassing. I think Cyril managed to, managed to deal with it. Um, now, he's going to be speaking on, um, I think he's titled up there, um, regarding polymers, which is his research effort, but research work. But it's going to be a lot, a lot broader than that. Um, do I introduce... Vijay now. Um, the other speaker we have is Vijay Sivaraman. Vijay is, again, an engineer, but from electrical engineering. And what you'll notice, and I'll mention this again a bit in my summing up, is there are quite a lot of um, synergies in these two talks, and I'll, I'll get you to reflect on those as they're speaking. But, but Vijay is one of the, again, what I would call one of the, our consummate networkers, but in this case, with, with industry. I remember... I was just walking down the streets of North Sydney and then bump into VJ because VJ is about to head off and visit, a, visit an industry partner. In fact, I bump into him more off campus than I do on campus, but I mean that in a positive way, the way VJ. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he's going to be talking something very significant, and that's, that's on the on development of the internet and, and his role in that. So I won't speak anymore. I think you didn't come to listen to me. And I'd like to invite Cyril to, to start us off. Nice. Oh, 
Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Mark, for, for this very kind introduction. I hope I will not disappoint you today. And uh, I would like to thank, of course, UNSW for this uh, opportunity, because it's, uh, it's a very great opportunity for me uh, to give you an overview of what my group is doing. And uh, hopefully, uh, it's not going to be too boring. But first, I would like uh, to introduce a bit myself. As you can hear, I don't have the Aussie accent. But uh, my French accent, I keep my French accent. It's part of me. And uh, I'm born, in fact, I grew up in a very small town close to, uh, to Avignon. Which, and in this town, we have a very nice castle, as you can see. It's, uh, and also, we produce qu quite good wine, red wine, and uh, as good as Australian wine, I think. But uh, at the end of my school, I moved to Montpellier, not very far. Still part of, south part of France, because I like the sun, I like the beach. And uh, in fact, I went to the University of Montpellier, which is one of the oldest universities in France, uh, built in the 13th centuries. And uh, of course, I met a lot of professors, but one of these professors was Professor Boutevin, and uh, he inspired me. In fact, I done my PhD in this group, because he offered me, of course, a position there. And this PhD was very interesting, because in fact, I was working with Solve Solexis, this was a PhD, a joint PhD uh, between university and the company. And we were uh, working on the adhesive for fuel tanks. And it was interesting because we could um, transfer some technology we were developing, fundamental research to applied research. And uh, I think it was a great opportunity for me. Then uh, during this PhD, we developed some technology. And one of these technologies attracted the attention of Dupont Performance Elastomer. And uh, in fact, I worked there for uh, one year, and then we developed polymers for aer aerospace and uh, aeronautics, and it was quite a, a very interesting experience uh, also in this part. And then in 2006, I decided to, to move uh, to another place. And in fact, I moved uh, to Australia at the University of New South Wales in the Center for Advanced Macromolecular Design. And, uh, and since I'm here, quite good for me at this moment. Yes, sir. Are you listening? Yes, I am. Plastics. Exactly. How do you mean? There's a great future in plastics. Think about it. Will you think about it? Yes, I will. Enough said. Yes, plastics. I use this video because, in fact, I'm going to talk about polymers. And when I talk about polymers, everyone say, oh, you work in plastics. And it's not exactly what we're doing all the time. But today I will try to, to show you plastics is of course polymers, but polymers is more than plastic. And it's what is going to, my, to be today in my talk. First, a bit history of polymers. Polymers has been identified in 1920. It's very recent science, in fact, if we look. And this Professor Stoninger published his first paper about polymers. And he was awarded the Nobel Prize for chemistry in 1953. In fact, polymers, as we know, are long chain of short repeating molecular units linked by covalent bonds. And uh, this was, of course, an important uh, step for us. But at this moment, especially at this time, I should say not everyone agreed. And one of his colleagues, Professor Willand, was a very important organic chemist. And you can see he received the, the Nobel Prize of Chemistry in uh, 1927. In this case, he sent him a letter saying, in fact, polymers do not exist. And this was, of course, uh, quite surprising at the moment, because we know polymers exist everywhere. We use everywhere, every day and everywhere. You can see we use for a range of applications, as you can see here. We have produced since 1950 9 billion tons of polymers. And it's a market of $600 billion. It's quite an impressive market and it's growing at 8% every year. You know, it's, it's important, but polymers use a lot of resources, especially uh, fossil resources. In this case, we use around 8% uh, to produce monomers, but also to make these polymers. It means we use a lot of energy to make these polymers. And one of the uh, orientation or, or direction I decide for my groups in 2013 is to develop new process capable to make these polymers using uh, more renewable resource. 
away. And we decide to use, in fact, to harness the power of the sun. It's what we decide to do. As we know, UNSW has been very successful to transform solar, uh, solar energy into electricity and uh, using solar panels. We know plants also as very, uh, very good in terms of to transform this solar energy into uh, materials. And of course, I should mention there is uh, some, someone in 1912, uh, in fact, Professor Giacomo Shaminchan, uh, tried to, to develop, in fact, visible light to, met, uh, to mediate chemical reactions. And he published a very interesting paper in science in 1912 as uh, is a fo photochemistry of the future. And of course, this was a very inspiring paper because if you read this paper, it compares the science or the organic chemistry uh, and the plant. And he says the plant has a better way to make organic molecules than what we can do now. And of course, inspired by all this, we, he used his lab. You can see his lab was very special in the balcony in Milan. And you can see he was using this flask. This was at the University of Milan and they investigate different chemical reactions. Of course, we have been inspired by this work and also other work before. But what we decide to do is, can we do a polymerization activate by visible light? And uh, this is what we try to do. And in 2014, we report the first uh, process. In fact, the process, we name it at Petraft. Uh, this is a very simple process where we use a photocatalyst this photocatalyst can be chlorophyll. We can extract chlorophyll uh, from spinach leaf or green plant. It's very simple, very green process. And we, of course, we have monomers. And when we activate the light, we have a transfer of energy and we can do some polymerization. Of course, when we turn off the light, the polymerization stops. This means now we have a very easy way to manipulate and control the polymerization just by using the light. And we can, of course, use LED light or we can use the solar, or the sun, sorry. Of course, this is working quite well. We can again turn on the light, and you can see the polymerization can continue. It's a very efficient, as I say, way to, to manipulate the structure of the polymers, which was not possible before. Of course, we can construct and build more complex structure. As you can see, if we add more monomers, and we add different monomers, these are, of course, monomers. Uh, we can, uh, if we're turning on the light, we can uh, build, for example, this uh, type of polymers where you have two different types of monomers in this precise way. We have also be able to, using this technique, to, uh, to build this complex architecture, as you can see. Here. But just, I want to show you an example. One of the examples uh, I want to show you is, in fact, using this technique to make nanoparticles. And we decide, in, uh, of course, in, in this work to, to control by using light to, to synthesize nanoparticles with a specific control in terms of size and in terms of shape. As you can see, by using light, we can control the size of these nanoparticles. And the size of these nanoparticles range from 10 nanometers to 300 microns. It means it's uh, one million times smaller than apples, very small, tiny nanoparticle object but also we have the ability to manipulate the shape just by using different, uh, using this technique of polymerization. You can see we can make spherical, cylindrical, or more complex shapes, as you can see here. And all these nanoparticles can have several types of application. One of the applications, they can be used to transport uh, molecules. In this case, we can, of course, encapsulate compounds inside of these nanoparticles. And one of these compounds, for example, can be doxorubicin. Doxorubicin is a therapeutic agent and uh, you can use for drug delivery. It's like this nano carrier, or like a plastic bag when you go to Kohl's or Woolworths. It means we can put grocery inside of this object and they can carry uh, these molecules. It means you can use this object to uh, deliver a therapeutic compound to a cell. In collaboration with Professor Justin Goodin and Katharina Goss, we decide to see how this nanoparticle can go inside of the cell. It means how the effect of the shape can influence the way this nanoparticle will travel inside of the cell. In fact, we investigate three shapes, as you can see here, and this is using a technique uh, developed by Elizabeth Ind, 
we, it's a very special technique, I wish to say, in microscopy. We can see how this nanoparticle travels inside, and we find, in fact, the spherical nanoparticles stay in the cytoplasm. But this particle tends to go in nucleus, means they have different way to go, and they diffuse a different way inside of the cell. It was a very interesting work, and this has an implication, of course, because if you're putting a drugs inside of this nanoparticle, and you want this drug to go in the nucleus, you, it's better to use this type of nanoparticle compared to this one. But this, of course, is an application. Today, I would like to talk about another application, a more uh, maybe applied application. Of course, um, we know pancreatic cancer is a very bad disease. It's uh, one of the most common cancer in both men and women in Australia. And we know Steve Jobs in 2011 died from this cancer. In fact, the success rate, oh, sorry, the survival rate is less than 20% for after five years. This work is in collaboration with Phoebe Phillips and Mart uh, Maria Cavallaris. In this case, we want to de develop nanoparticles capable to deliver sRNA. sRNA is a very special molecule. This molecule can stop the production of specific proteins in the, in the cell. This means if we want to inject sRNA directly in our body, it will degrade very quickly. In fact, it has very poor stability, and especially in our blood. But what we decide to do, in collaboration, as I say, with Maya and Phoebe, we decide to develop nanoparticles capable to load or to encapsulate this sRNA. And we can design these nanoparticles. They can absorb or encapsulate this sRNA. They can prevent the degradation. And also, they can deliver more specifically this sRNA in pancreatic cancer. I will just want to show you why. In fact, nanoparticles can accumulate in tumor tissue. In fact, if we compare normal tissue and tumor tissue, we see there is a difference. You can see here the blood vessel. This is a blood vessel. And you see a big difference with tumor tissues. The cells are disorganized. These cells are a bit. And you can see some gap appear. Here, we don't see this gap. In fact, this allows these nanoparticles to accumulate and to escape from the blood vessel and go to this tumor. And they will accumulate inside of this tumor, and this will allow, in fact, a specific delivery of nanoparticles. Of course, just some data from Phoebe. We can see if we inject sRNA in the mouse, we don't see an sRNA in the different organ after a few hours. If you inject the sRNA, and this sRNA is red, you can see, we can see on this map uh, in different organs, we see the accumulation of sRNA in the tumor here after 24 hours. It means it's a very efficient way to target a specific uh, zone in the, uh, in the body, for example. Uh, finally, I would like to show you, of course, when you inject this sRNA, you can see we reduce the production of the protein, protein by 80%. You can see a very significant reduction of this protein, and this means we can cure or we can treat more efficiently this cancer. Of course, this is at a mass level, or it's more work has to be done. But I would like to go more in the future now. I want to talk about precision polymer synthesis for precision medicine. In fact, if we compare a natural polymer, such as protein or DNA, and a synthetic polymer, such as this one, we see there's a big difference. The difference here is uniform. A natural polymer is completely uniform. This means all the monomers are perfectly organized in the polymer chain. In synthetic polymers, we do not have this organization. In fact, we have a more random distribution, as you can see here. The reason is we do not have the technology to precisely place the monomers in the polymer chains. And what we have developed more recently, using our technology of visible light, we can now incorporate more precisely monomers. For this, we use different wavelengths, and we can add monomers after monomers by changing the wavelength, and we can do this like building with Lego on a molecular scale. This means we have these nice tools now. What can we do with this? The application can be multiple. One can be data storage. In fact, we can mimic DNA. We know DNA is the best way to store information at the moment much better than your hard drive. In fact, this is 
consuming a lot of energy, a lot of space. If we can use DNA, we will be able to store all the information on the internet in this single bottle. This will be extremely efficient. Of course, Amazon and Google is, uh, are very interested in this technology. Second point can be, we can use now this synthetic polymer with bioactivity. We can imagine these polymers will be bioactive and could do some interesting things in your body. Finally, I would like just to show you another application uh, of these sequence polymers or defined polymers, like I should say, it's antimicrobial polymers. In fact, we know antimicrobial resistance is rapidly, rapidly becoming a big problem and a crisis for us. Today, 7,000 people die every year of this infectious disease. But according to this report, in 2050, maybe this number will increase to 10 million. In fact, this is due to, of course, we use misuse antibiotics, and this has resulted by the produ or in the production of a bacteria resistant against this antibiotic. And this, of course, is an important problem. But one of the mechanisms our immune system use is the production of antimicrobial peptides. This peptide can uh, kill, uh, in fact, this bacteria, and they are used by our body. But the problem of this peptide, as you can see, uh, it's first is complex. And uh, for example, in this structure, you can see it's a long molecules. This mo long molecule contains some amines, for example, or cis groups or other groups. And you can see they're placed in a specific ways. It means it's a very important where are these groups in these molecules. And what we decide to do, of course, as a polymer chemist, is to try to solve one of, of these two problems of this peptide. One problem is, like I show you, the B-venom is not very healthy for us. It's a bit toxic. And the second problem is to try to produce this in large scale. And for this, polymer chemistry can help. In fact, if we design and if we use monomers such as this one, I show you a very similar structure before, this one and this one, we can now build polymers which can have the same property. All these polymers will play some key role. First, this monomer will bond with the bacterial membrane. Second, this, poly this monomers will disrupt the membranes, means they will increase the toxicity, and the third, this one, will give us the biocompatibility. And I have a very, very patient student, and uh, this student designed, in fact, a library of polymers, more than 50 different poly uh, polymers, and what he has done, he has changed the order of these monomers. It means he placed this one at this position and, and done this in several combinations, and we have tested these polymers against different bacteria, against five different bacteria. And according how we place the monomers, we can see we have different response. The response is when it's yellow and green, it means the polymer is very efficient. When the polymer is not efficient, it's red. It means when you kill bacteria, it's, uh, you will see yellow or green color on this graph. And you can see, according to the structure of the polymers, you can see here, this polymer do not work at all, but for example, if we use these polymers, this polymer will start to work, and you can see they are very specific to specific bacteria. It means according how we dispose the monomers in the polymer structure, we can see a different activity, which I think is very exciting for us, because I think this is shows the precision polymer synthesis could have an implication in, uh, of course, in the bio, uh, in the bio response. Of course, all the technology we developed last few years has attracted some interest, and uh, we have been lucky to start to collaborate with all these different groups in the world, and uh, hopefully we'll do more. For example, with Harvard using light, we try to, to go to the why, how life has been created in, uh, on Earth. This means uh, the origin of the life, and this is one of the projects we're doing with Harvard using, of course, our light polymerization technique but also has been very lucky to have a very great mentor at UNSW last 10 years. And I should also acknowledge all these students that have done a terrific work since uh, oh, maybe, yes, last 10 years or two. And I also have a very good uh, past member in my groups. It's a great future in plastics. And I will finish with this. There is a great future in the plastic. And finally, I would like to thank you very much for your attention.
This is good. This is why I went to my city. You give everyone lots of alcohol and then they ask <laughs> Thank you very much, Cyril. That, that was wonderful. We've now got our second lecture of the afternoon. And I'd like to see Vijay along. What I also should be telling Vijay is he's been able to do something that certainly I don't often manage and very few people manage. He's actually to get some of his family to come and listen to his lecture. And I'd like to just welcome his wife, uh, Ramana Jafranti. Vijay, I hope you. Um, Hi, um, is the mic working? Wonderful. So, yes. thank you very much for the introduction, Mark. And uh, yes, it did take a bit of arm twisting to get my son to come along when I said do you want to come for my inaugural lecture? He says, Dad, you lecture me every day anyway. What, <laughs> what new could you possibly say at the, at the talks? So I said, you come along. You might get a little surprise. So I will actually use him as a bit of a subject for my, uh, for my speech today. So, so look, thank you again for taking the time to come and listen to me. Um, I'll talk a bit about my own personal journey, um, a bit about what's uh, happening in the area of internet innovation, and, and a bit about some of my passions and, and why I'm here. So... I'll begin the journey about 21 years back when I started my PhD at UCLA, that's the University of California in Los Angeles. Um, quite an incredible place, um, beautiful campus, very wealthy. Uh, it's in LA, that, that could be a bit of a negative, but nevertheless, it was, a, it was really a, a great place to be, especially if you're working in internet technologies, uh, because UCLA is a hotbed of invention when it comes to the internet. So my supervisor, Professor Mario Gerla, um, He's done lots of incredible stuff in the area of internet technologies, but also an extremely nice person to work with. Um, but not just him, the others in the group, most notably uh, Leonard Kleinrock was actually Mario's supervisor. He was still at UCLA when I was there, even though he wasn't on my panel. Actually, I did speak to him several times and get pieces of advice. He's considered one of the fathers of the internet. So in fact, UCLA claims to be the first node on the ARPANET, which became the internet. And uh, Leonard Kleinrock himself personally sent the first message on the internet. So it was quite an incredible place to be. Internet was kind of in the blood, so it's something you had to do. So I felt incredibly lucky that I was in the right place doing my research on internet technologies. So my PhD thesis itself was about how do you schedule or schedule, depending on whether you like the American or the British version, packets in an internet switch. You know, Packets are things you put your internet data into, it goes through the, the infrastructure, goes through some switches. And my job was to determine whether your video package should go before your web browsing or your download or your operating system upgrade and so on and so forth, to put it in very simple words. And the idea I was exploring was, hey, if you put deadlines on packets and work according to a deadline, wouldn't that be a great idea? And something I've been doing pretty much most of my life now is working to deadlines, as we all know. Now, Saying that is easy, but analyzing it, it turns out to be really difficult. So I developed a, a lot of mathematics, lots of Greek, lots of lemmas, theorems, corollaries, proofs, and all this kind of stuff. And the end conclusion was that I had a fantastic model. So if you look at the, uh, what you see in the lab, the curve at the bottom, and my model bang on, matching each other almost perfectly. And the best we had in the literature was off by at least an order of magnitude or more. Right? So I was pretty chuffed. I was like, this is awesome. And my thesis had more Greek than English uh, because it was mostly mathematical. So having done all this work at UCLA, the birthplace of the internet, I was feeling extremely pumped up and saying, I'm pretty hot property. Let me go out there and, and get myself a job. And that's exactly what I did. I went to Silicon Valley. Being in California, that wasn't far away. And I said, right, show me these internet companies. I know something about the internet. I've written a whole thesis on it. Give me a job. So um, I went and interviewed you know, with a bunch of companies. And I ended up uh, taking a job at a company called Atoga Systems. It had all of four people. Um, Three of them were executives. There was only one other technical person. Nevertheless, they interviewed me for most part of the day. 
And at the end of the day, the CEO comes along and he says, yeah, Vijay, yeah, you've done really well in the interviews and everything. We're kind of on the fence. You know, you look like a smart guy, but you've done a PhD. So I said, what's wrong with that? I mean, you've grilled me all day on it. You seem to think it was all pretty okay. It's like, yeah, your PhD is all all right, but you know, a lot of research is just intellectual self-gratification. There's nothing really tangible that comes out of it. So, and you've spent you know, your last three to four years doing that. So I said, oh, well, uh, do you want to give me a job? And they said, yeah, sure, you look like a smart guy, so we'll take you on board. And that's kind of when I stepped out of the university and, and took up a real job and realized what it takes to actually get a product built. Right? So in the three years that I spent at this startup, um, it was definitely not just intellectual you know, self-gratification. It was a grind. I ended up spending a lot of work working in many, many aspects of building this product out here, which if you have a quarter million dollars spare in your pocket, you could have bought. Now, this is an internet switch. This is the kind of device through which your packets in the internet go through. And by God, it took a lot of effort to build one of these things. So obviously, we were a small company and also a small team. Um, and I was thrown in the deep end from day one. I had done my PhD thesis on something narrow, how to schedule packets, that's it. But this beast here has to do a million other things. I had to parse incoming packets, I had to put them in the right place in memory, I had to keep the, you know, do the bookkeeping around it, I had to decide which queue to put it in, I had to make sure that the delays were being met, the rates were being met, I had to write the firmware, I had to write the databases, the, the, you know, the configurations of these devices. I wrote a whole set of protocols, you know, Ethernet protocols, IP protocols, TCP related protocols. I even built user interfaces. So three years of hard work, you know, the grind to actually build one of these devices. And I really understood what my boss meant when he said that you were just doing self-gratification in your PhD. Not that I want to put it down, but we'll get back to that. So of course, it was all very hard work and a photo of my desk with a sleeping bag mattress-like thing below it. It was a startup. so. You know, on average, one night uh, a week, I would end up sleeping there because it's, hey, it's already morning. What's the point going home and having a shower and coming back? They have showers here. They have everything here. So I might as well just sleep here and kind of, you know, keep working. Um, so you might think a fairly grim life, wasn't it? Well, in some ways it was, but it, I think it, it helped forged me in, in many ways. But that being said, one good thing about this company is that we had a, a lot of money. Um, we raised... I joined in March before any money was raised, so I was taking a fairly big risk. In May that year, we raised 15, 14 and a half million. That's not bad for a small company. And the year after, we raised another 50 million. So all in all, about 64 and a half million, which means we had a pretty good party over those three years. Um, we did have a lot of fun while building this, uh, but yes, it did take a lot of effort. So unfortunately for us, the timing went a bit off. By about 2002, the market started turning sour. The, you know, the dot-com bust you might have heard of, and we were very seriously affected uh, because most of the customers we were talking to trying to sell this, they, they kind of vanished, they folded up. Um, so the party kind of stopped at that point. And uh, so in 2003, um, there was the time when I was feeling a bit burnt out having done all this and see it come to close to naught. My wife, in the meantime, who's sitting somewhere in the audience here, um, she was finishing up her PhD at UCLA. So we had met at UCLA, and unlike us engineers, she charged us, ah, you guys do a PhD in three to three and a half years. That's not a real PhD at all. In science, we do the real PhDs. Six years of slogging it out, you know, all kinds of mental breakdowns and seeing the psychologists and all that kind of stuff. You've got to go through all that stuff to really earn your PhD. So she was finishing up her PhD, and we were both a bit burnt out. We said, oh, we need a break from all this. And that's when we moved to Australia, right? Because the job opportunity came up here. Um, and unlike our PhDs, which might be considered a lot of uh, you know, self-gratification, um, our marriage was more than that. We did have, we do have two wonderful offspring. Uh, the older one, Nayan, uh, chubby and smiley when he was born, liked his food from day one and he still likes it. He's also sitting here. Where is, where is he actually? Oh, right there at the back, yeah. So um, he was born in 2008, and then our second one, uh, Kieran, born in, uh, sorry, born in 2004, and the second one, Kieran, born in 2008, kind of born with a bit of a quizzical look on his face, and he, I think he still 
holds that. So anyway, both of them are extremely charming lads. Um, and uh, and it's, it's been a you know, wonderful time over the, over the last 10 odd years since we have had them. Of course, all this while, both Blanca and myself, uh, as academics, have been kind of trying to forge our careers. So, but we'll get back to my kids soon. But being in Australia, you know, having been in academia, done research, written papers, and done deep mathematical stuff, and having worked in industry for three years, when we came down to Australia, it was a bit of a time for me to sit back and reflect, you know, what is the difference between the two, now that I've had a bit of a taste of both? And a few points that come to mind, you know, in academia, we, we focus a lot on depth. We get really deep, narrow, solve a really tough problem. That's great. Industry often wants breadth, because to put together one of those devices I showed you, an internet switch, in a couple of slides back, it took an incredible amount of breadth, you know, everything from user interfaces down to building chips and programming them and, and, programming them and so on. In our research, we are often used to very scope problems, whereas in the real world, a lot of the effort is actually ecosystem integration. Right, I built this chip. Now, which kind of board does it need to go on? Who are the manufacturers I need to talk to? Who's the software going to be written by? Who's the, so there's a lot of integration you actually need to think about how what you've built is going to get used, get operated, who's going to pay for it, and so on. In academia, we often like very you know, complex and optimum solutions, right? So when we write a paper, if we haven't really proved what we have done is optimum, uh, there's a chance you might get rejected. Uh, surely you can do better than that, right? Whereas industry often likes quick solutions. They can't wait three years to get an optimum solution. Maybe in three years they will take an optimum solution, but in the meantime, you have to give them quick and dirty solutions, which they can put to use validate everything around it. You know, the whole business model around it has to be validated. Um, and there's also the issue of complexity. As academics, we often like complexity. Like complexity makes us feel, oh, we have done things, something really hard, really difficult. Isn't that fantastic? But in industry, one has to realize that the solutions need to be operated. It's okay to build a switch, but when it gets put into the network, somebody has to manage that thing upgrade it, operate it, enable the features, integrate it into their bigger solution. Uh, and that means people who operate it shouldn't need to be trained to that level of expertise. It has, the operations has to be simple. So we have to simplify the solutions when we give it to industry so they can then take it and operate it. And of course, in academia, we like innovation. We are always saying, what's the new thing that we can do? Um, industry doesn't necessarily care for innovation. They really care for practicality. It should work. It should fit into your, you know, into your business model, and it is something that we can put out there. So there was a bit of a dilemma for me to think, I like doing both. I like doing innovation, and I like being practical. How can I do both at the same time? Um, you know, as I showed you that the, the internet switch that we built um, was, was an appliance, a device that you had to build. You had to build the hardware, the chips, the boards, the, the whole, you know, the metallic case even, and write all the software. And it took a lot of money. We burned $64.5 million, and we were still not successful. It took a lot of time and a lot of effort to build. Um, sitting in academia, we really can't sit and build those things. So I would need to go and convince a vendor to, to implement the idea that I have that goes into the switch. But the vendor will say, well, your idea, to know if it's valuable, I need to convince the operators who buy my equipment that what you're doing is worthwhile. So then you have to go around and try to convince the operators that what you're doing is worthwhile. So you realize that taking an innovation from academia or an, or, or an idea, what you think is a worthwhile idea, out to market means there's many people you need to convince. And the more the pe parties you need to convince, the lower your chance of actually being able to put it into the market. So and the other thing is that even though innovation, you might think there's a lot of innovation happening in the internet space, the reality is that a lot of innovation is on the internet or over the internet rather than in the internet. Yes, the Googles and the Facebooks and Amazons have been doing their you know, social networking and searches and, and uh, retailing, but they are just building applications on top of the internet. They don't actually get into the internet infrastructure. Doing research or innovation inside the internet infrastructure turns out to be really difficult because you have to build these chunky hardware appliances, which takes tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars. So that was a bit of a dilemma for me to say, well, what do I want to do? Um, luckily, I chose to be in academia, and I'm really thankful for that because, uh, as I will show you soon, this dilemma, the solution started emerging to this particular dilemma. In fact, the solution that 
emerged um, in about 2008. This is when this movement started, something called software-defined networking. And the basic idea here, here is actually extremely simple, almost laughably simple, which is to say, separate the hardware from the software. That's it. Hardware is the brawn. It can process things very quickly. It can take packets at tens of gigabits per second, terabits per second, and process them within nanoseconds. Right? It can keep up with very high rates. Hardware is good for that. But let it be dumb. Don't try to make it smart. Right? Keep it dumb and keep it fast. And let the intelligence sit in the software. That's where you can make it much, much more dynamic, much, much more intelligent. Um, and you can actually scale it. If you need more compute, because of cloud computing that was emerging in those days, you can actually scale it to your needs. And as long as you uh, standardize the interface between the hardware and the software, you are able to decouple the two, which means you can now innovate in software reusing existing hardware. Conceptually very simple thing, but of course this was completely breaking the industry because there were very entrenched vendors which, who are making billions and billions of dollars selling you this bundled appliance at a very marked up price. So it required some, some real push to get this movement uh, to get traction. And thankfully, um, the mastermind behind this, even though you can't see the faces very well, is that person second from the right, uh, a guy called Nick McEwen, is a professor at Stanford. Um, and me on the very left had the pleasure of spending half an hour with him just earlier uh, in October at an SDN World Congress. He was kind of the mastermind behind that. He mobilized a lot of the academia behind himself and also managed to convince Google that this was a good idea. Now you may say, why is Google interested in this? Google, the biggest expense they have are servers because they are a computing company. The second biggest expense they have are switches because all this data needs to flow across their infrastructure. And they are quite tired of paying huge market prices to buy these appliances from vendors. So they love the idea that you can actually separate the hardware and software because then the hardware becomes commodity, cheap, they can buy at scale, and software, uh, well, they're Google. They know something about software, right? They believe they can do that. So thankfully, this movement, which has been tried many times before in history, but was successful this time around due to a confluence of factors, cloud computing rising, hardware prices falling, but also big people in Stanford's, Princeton's, and Google's pushing it meant this time it actually got traction to the extent that now we can now think of the network rather than, being that, rather than being a bunch of appliances or switches connected with each other is a substrate on which you can write software applications to make it do whatever you want it to do, a bit like the iPhone, right? So Apple just gives you the iPhone. Apple doesn't give you every single app. If you had to rely on Apple to give you every single app as a bundled iPhone, you wouldn't be having too many apps. But the fact that the software was decoupled and opened up to developers meant that you could have real innovation. There are millions of people who have written millions of apps for this, and I can pretty much get an app for anything I want. So OK, as a concept, that sounds good. But can we actually see what this means? So what I'll try to do um, is to give you a couple of demos. I'll, I'll try at least and see if it works. The first use case, and this is a carrier who came and talked to us from Iran, and that's thanks to my uh, student, now colleague, Hassan, who, who has worked in Iran, and he was working, talking to an ISP who said, look, I have a problem. Um, Iran, we are under sanctions. We can only give our customers five gigabytes a month for international traffic. What happens, of course, kids have discovered iPads and iPhones. They're watching videos, and a week goes by into the monthly billing period, and the quota's burnt up, and they get phone calls to the saying, my quota could not have been burnt up. I've done nothing at all. It's like, yeah, but your kids are watching videos. But how do you prove it to them that their kids are actually burning up the quota? So if I were to ask you, in your house, do you know how many internet connected devices are there? What are they doing? Who's consuming the bandwidth? Who's consuming the quota? What websites are being visited? Are they safe, age appropriate? Are you involved in a cybersecurity attack, either receiving an attack or reflecting an attack onto somebody else? These can be. Unfortunately, there's no easy answers to these. And it's amazing that in spite of having had an internet connection in my house for 20, 25 years, many of us wouldn't still know the answers to these questions, right? Why? It's precisely because innovation was not happening. But with this movement, SDN, we can make this happen. And let me actually show you why. And not using some fancy gizmo that Google's going to sell you for $300 that you can put in your house, using a standard off-the-shelf 
home router that you get from your Dick Smith. And that's exactly what I have in my house. And I will try to show you what is happening in my house right now. So as a subscriber, I get a portal. And I just log into my portal with my credentials. And if things work, they do. I can actually see all the devices, apart in the color selection. Our students really need to be trained in better color selection. But apart from that, we can actually see that um, all the devices connected in my house, the name on the left, who it maps to the user, and then you know some details, um, and where was it last seen. So I could even hide the inactive devices. And at the moment, I can see in my house the Apple TV is connected, my one of the iPads, and sorry, the last one you can hardly read is the iMac. Never mind. I can then go to usage and say, what's happening right now? Nobody's at home, so not much is happening. I think my younger one's scratching away on a violin somewhere in front of somebody else. So, um, but I can go in the last day. And I can see that about 17, 18 hours back, that was maybe a bit late last night, um, the pink color is the white iPad, which uh, I think my wife was watching some videos last night. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, but I can get this visibility uh, for the last day, for the last week. So obviously, you know, four days, five days back is Friday and Saturday. So obviously more activity in the home. But I can see which devices. The, the brown is, by the way, the Apple TV. So the kids were watching Apple TV on the Saturday and so on. This kind of visibility, it's amazing that for 20, 25 years, we have had home internet. We never had it before. But with this ecosystem, we built an app. And this app can show you these things. Right? And it is actually being used in Iran right now. And the ISP said, look, can you also start putting quotas? I said, sure, we can put a per device quota. So sorry, this got rolled over today because today is the first of the month and my billing uh, got rolled over. But you can see how much each person has used. You can give quotas because you've mapped devices to users. You could put a quota on a, on a user. So my older son gets uh, 200 gigabytes and my younger one gets 100. <laughs> if I reduce that and make it below the current consumption, which is zero right now, but yesterday it would have been high, all their devices get blocked off. So none of their devices will work, and I'll get a call saying, Daddy, the internet doesn't work. Right? So <laughs> now you know why. I can also um, I can do a bit more, and this is where I get a bit cheeky. I can actually start seeing. Uh, I can enable monitoring on certain devices. So I could go and say, hey, in the last day, uh, what have my two kids been watching? Right? So I can actually see the sites. <laughs> Skip this. I can see the sites. I can even do searches. Now my older one, as I said, likes food. So let's see if he's been doing anything food related. Sure enough, he's been going to, uh, what is it, to foodandwine.com. Even though it's rated MA, I guess because of the wine and the alcohol, but you know, it's food. And we know that he loves his food. So, so anyway, so that was just one illustration of a use case where we could use this concept of decoupling of the hardware and the software to build useful apps. And now you may think, hang on, it's all gimmicks, right? Apps, you know, teenagers write apps these days. It's actually a bit more than that. We are using our tool to actually collect analytics on what network behavior your devices in the home are showing. We are able to profile them, develop a signature. And if that signature changes, there's a cybersecurity attack potentially going on. And this concept, just earlier this year, uh, interested uh, Cisco which has actually signed a research contract with us to embed this in their catalyst line of switches. By the way, Cisco is the largest vendor of internet switches. So what we're doing is not just cute little toys. It's something that's actually getting industry traction and is going to be deployed potentially in tens of millions of switches out there in the internet. So um, I've already shown you these things, but I had them as backup in case the demo didn't work. I'll show you another quick use case, which is around our own campus. What is the internet activity going on on campus? Oh, all of you are shuddering. Um, <laughs> how many video streams are being watched? How many large downloads are going on? And again, by now you know that you, we can use this concept to see this happening in real time. Uh, I'll, I'll keep it really short because I know we don't want to spend too much time, but I can go to this shows you right now all the video streams going on in our campus. Every video stream, of course, the IP address is obfuscated. Um, we can show you, you know, which IP address is talking to which server. Is it a Google or, a, um, or an Alibaba stream or a Facebook stream? How long it's been going on? What's the volume? What's the rate? What's the resolution? We can show you all this in real time right now. And we can even show you the last hour, last year, and last week, how much traffic is coming from YouTube versus Netflix. And you might be interested to know there's actually UNSW video has spiked in the last week. Guess why? Students are actually 
looking at lectures to study for exams. But <laughs> till last week, till last week, UNSW video was almost non-existent, right? <laughs> so, so again, and, and there's a whole bunch of statistics. You can go and explore everything that you want. But the point is that you can see all this happening in real time, live. And it's not just about seeing it in real time. We log everything to a database. We can go back and tell you how long do video streams last from YouTube versus Netflix versus Twitch? Now, Twitch is gaming video, any of you who know. These are people who sit and watch other gamers play. I don't get it, but my son <laughs> loves it. Um, and that's actually watched for the longest time. So 40% of Twitch videos last more than 10 minutes, whereas only 2% of Facebook streams last more than uh, two minutes. So anyway, but these are the kind of insights you can get. Um, you can also see how often the resolution changes. Now, this is extremely important. In fact, just three weeks back, I was in a conversation with Telstra when I showed it to them. By the way, the project was sponsored by Optus. And they said, don't show it to Telstra. So I did it two weeks back. And the Telstra guy said, I want this in my network. I want to see. Bec why? Because he has conversations every quarter with Google and Netflix and so on. And Google and Netflix is telling them how good video is going over their network because they rate ISPs. He himself doesn't know. So what we're going to show him at least puts him on par with what Google and Netflix can see. So it has great practical significance. So anyway, um, since it's getting to time, I'll just summarize. That was a bit of past work. Obviously, we're very excited about it. But going forward, um, data is the big thing. And I've just put up a, the cover story from The Economist a few months back saying data is the most valuable resource now. Look at the big five companies, you know, Google's, Apple's, Amazon, Facebook, uh, and Microsoft. Data is their biggest asset. And I think that's a game we should also be playing. Uh, we are sitting on a campus, a large campus, which is a huge oil field of data. We need to learn better how to extract it, refine it, and get value out of it. And, and, and I believe there are great opportunities because you know, we have real estate, we have rooms, classrooms, parking, we have retail, we have you know, cars, bicycles, light rails, pedestrians. We have all kinds of physical, virtual, and social activity. And in fact, we have started doing a, work, a bit of work on Smart Campus, and we can actually show you how the lecture theaters in our campus are being used. We have picked up that attendance tends to drop. And this is all in real time. You can see it for yourself. You can actually see classes have been canceled if you look at the, uh, the green curve. And you can see a spike on the red curve. That was actually a mid-session test on that day. We went back and verified on the course outline that that was indeed the case. So to summarize, as you can see, we are Academics are generally passionate about something, so I, I believe in, in our group the passion is really to translate what we do in academia into you know, something in practice with industry. It still pains me that there's a big gap between academia and industry. We tend to do our things and publish, and industry goes and does its things. I think there's a lot of opportunity to bridge this gap, um, which obviously means a bit of work on, on our part as academics. We need to understand the business ecosystem. We need to understand who do we need to convince, how does the money flow, because these things are important in the business world. But this, of all times, is one of the most incredible times to help shape industry. Why? At least in internet technologies, the world is changing. Right? Uh, everybody's scared of Amazons and Googles and Facebooks coming in and slaughtering existing businesses. So uh, this is when industries are also kind of trying to keep up with the fast change of uh, fast pace of technology. And I think. UNSW has incredible assets, not just talented researchers, but we have incredibly energetic students. Most companies have to pay people to work for them. Our students pay us to work for us. Um, we have an incredible campus in which a lot of data is being generated. So I think if we were to learn better how to tap into our resources um, and experiment on ourselves so that when we go to industry, it's not just an idea. It's something, it's a medicine we have ourselves had. You know, as the expression says, eat your own dog food or drink your own Kool-Aid. I think if we were to do more of that, we would have even better traction with the industry. So that being said, I'd like to uh, thank an uh, incredible number of uh, you know, incredible people who have helped me throughout my journey. Uh, of course, fantastic set of students who have who've taken on the challenge and put their solutions out into the, into the real world. You know, great colleagues, uh, collaborators, you know, both from within but also from industry. Um, I really want to thank my head of school, Ambi, for being incredibly supportive. Uh, faculty, thanks, Mark. And, and uh, last but not least, my family, my kids for being the subject of my experimentation. And of course, my wife for being incredibly patient with me, both with my research work and also my other passion, which is cricket. Not an easy passion to put up with uh, for a spouse. Um, 
And we are actually starting to work on our first two discovery grant together. So I look forward to the interesting dinner table discussions around part C, which is around budgets uh, <laughs> when we get to that. So that being said, thank you very much again. For Two wonderful presentations. What I really like when you have two academics getting together is the sparring. We had Cyril standing up there and basically he knew the guy that was following him was going to talk about the internet, so he basically said, all of your work can go into a plastic bottle. <laughs> <laughs> and then VJ comes up and says, well, it's actually nothing to do about the data in the internet. It's all the software that goes behind it. So actually what he said is about any relevance whatsoever. <laughs> But listen, we do have two really wonderful presentations. And just reflecting on them, the beauty of this, my role in this, is I get to basically sit there and have to actually have to give this wonderful summing up afterwards, which is, I have to tell you, it's quite stressful. I've got to pay attention. I can't look at my email. I have to do it all the right reasons. But there's a couple of themes in those two presentations that, that really struck me. The first one is around collaboration, success is built working with others. And, and Cyril started us off right through his presentation. He said, there's this great scientific finding, and these are the people I did it with. And I think that's actually something that we really need to, to reflect on, because this is what makes success. And then v Vijay came through, and he basically said, well, there's all this stuff that's happened, but it's actually all my industry partners that, are, that have driven it. And I think that's one thing that's really the first thing that came out of this, which is a really important part of success is that we need to work with others. And it's not just the people we're working with, because the second theme was that, that both of them gave a really good context to essentially say that there were some great people that came before me to do this. Cyril basically talked to, had this very interesting, very interesting analogy, which said, um, what's the name? Otto Weinfield, who basically says, well, actually, polymers are not even possible. And then um, Herman came behind with actually a Nobel Prize in polymers. And then Chiamachi, and you've got some easier names to pronounce in the presentation, <laughs> came through and basically talked about the whole idea of photosynthesis. And that was what great research was built on. And then Vijay basically told us about Clone Rock, who basically, the whole internet, the whole internet story. And I think it's, it's that aspect, the other, that's the second aspect, is that, is that we're building on the work of others when we do, do great research. We're doing it with others and we're building on the work of others. The other thing that was really special about both of these presentations is that they're really working at essentially the forefront of what society is actually at. If you, if you think about it, I'm a material scientist and we always talk about Ceramics, metals, polymers. Ceramics have been around for, for thousands of years. Metals have been around for thousands of years. Polymers were only created essentially, essentially less than 100 years ago. And look at the impact they've actually made in society. And Cyril talked about how it's actually going forward. So this is actually, we have to think about it in the scale of things. This is really at the front of where society is at. And then Vijay even sort of topped that in his bar. He said, well, I'm working on the internet. And that first packet that was actually sent, and I've read a book called, called The Innovators, which gives this whole story. And packets are actually a big deal for those of you who haven't read it. I mean, you try to get it from Peter's talk. That first packet was only sent in 1969 from MIT to UCLA. It was very recently, if you look up the scale of things. And now we're actually at UNSW taking that forward. But the, but the most important similarity that came out of both of those presentations, which, which really hit me, was actually... The, the impact of the work they were having. We got a really nice, I think you, um, VJ mentioned that it is sort of research on its own is sort of there for self gratification. That was probably a little bit, a little bit harsh. Um, and I think the fundamental scientists, if they're into the audience, of course, probably a bit rough. But at the end of the day, the, the research is one thing. We can create stuff within the university, but it's actually the impact that that's going to have. And Cyril gave us this really significant. <coughs> talk about how the research is actually affecting the delivery of drugs to, to cancers, which are a huge part of what affects li lives of everybody, <coughs> how to actually do that better. And that work is really advancing. And he acknowledged the collaborators, which are a part of that. 
And then, then VJ, in my mind, popped it because he basically showed how I can track what my kids are doing on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> now, I was thinking, gosh, saving cancer. And I thought, oh, gosh, tracking what the kids, stopping cancer, tracking what the kids are doing. Oh, that's, even, that's even more significant. And, I, <laughs> and, I, and he then reflected on the inspiration his family gives for this research. And I can fully understand that. If that was my field, I'd be doing exactly the same thing. But then you're going to be tracking what our students are doing. Now, I find that actually you know, a little bit scary. <laughs> so we've got these wonderful messages. We've got essentially the, the significance of collaboration, the fact that we build on the work of others, the fact that we're, our researchers, these, these two researchers are at the forefront of what's saving society, but ultimately it's the, it's the impact. And you then reflect on the, on the life story. Cyril gave us this map essentially coming from the south, south, of, south of France, goes to the US for a year, and then comes to UNSW. VJ comes from, comes from Delhi, then goes to the goes to the US, and then comes to UNSW. And I think this is something that we really should value: is that the people that we've attracted to UNSW from a whole range of places is actually really important. Because let's face it, VJ and Cyril and most of us have other. Have, there are many options around the world where we can work, but there's something special to be able to come here, and it's it's really something special. I mean. Cyril tried to say, well, there's actually great wine in, in, in Sydney as well. But Sydney is, let's face it, a great place to live. I mean, the VC often says this is the most wonderful city in the world. And the VC was nearly 60 before he realised this. I mean, we have far more significant achievers here who realised this much earlier in life. We're, we're far earlier starters than our VC to actually, actually realise this. They are really fast learners, and the reason for that, let's face it, you're engineers. That's how you fast learners. That, that's how you, and this is what makes us so proud. But overall, we've got had two presentations today from two brilliant researchers who are not just researchers, they're actually having a really significant in, impact on society. And they're doing that by working with others, including people, people in this room. So in summing up, I just want everyone to congratulate them on a great achievement for achieving professors and thank them for their presentations. Now, to close this off, I'd like Eileen Baldry to just sum up so few words. Thank you, Mark. We won't hold you up any longer. There is wine and something else out there. Maybe, uh, maybe not uh, from the south of France. But <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you for celebrating uh, a very significant milestone for both uh, Cyril and VJ. Uh, so join us outside and, and congratulate them again. Thank you.